Okay, we've been talking about boundaries in this unit, and baby, we're just gonna keep on doing it, and here we're gonna consider the functions of political boundaries. So if you're ready to get them brain cows milked, let's get to it. So like I said, we've been talking a lot about boundaries, which is a key concern in political geography. But how, says you, are those boundaries created? What an insightful question, my young geographer, and the answer is that there are four phases that characterize the creation of boundaries. The first phase is defining the boundary in which countries explicitly state where their boundaries are located through legal documentation, like treaties, and they often reference natural features like rivers or mountains or lines of latitude and longitude. And these boundaries establish the limits of a state's sovereignty. We control this, but not this. Boom, boundary defined. For example, the northwestern boundary between the United States and Canada was defined in a negotiated treaty between the US and Great Britain to run along the 49th parallel. Okay, now the second phase is delimiting the boundary, which means to draw those legal boundaries on a map. And here's an official map drawing that boundary along the 49th parallel. Then the third phase is demarcating the boundary, which means that the boundary is marked not on a map, but with physical objects like pillars and walls on the landscape. For example, all of Along the 49th parallel, both states have erected these pillars as a physical indication of the boundary's location. Or go to the southern border of the United States with Mexico and along some parts of the border is a physical wall. Now that's controversial, but all I'm saying is there's a wall. Oh, and by the way, if you need help getting an A in your class and a five on your exam in May, then you might want to check out my AP Human Geography Heimler Review Guide. It's got exclusive unit review videos, note guides to follow along, practice questions, practice tests, and answer keys for all of it. And that link is in the description. Okay, now the fourth phase is the administration of the boundary, which describes all the measures that states use to enforce that boundary. Like, it wouldn't be much good to go through all that trouble to define and demarcate boundaries if states didn't also make sure that those lines were respected. So that means for most countries, international borders are restricted. Like, you can't just go in and out of these boundaries for funsies. No, you typically need some kind of government permission or documentation, like a passport or a visa. Okay, so that's the process by which boundaries are defined. And wouldn't it be nice if every state drawing boundaries just agreed on those limits and gave each other a nice hug? Well, yeah, that'd be nice, but alas, that is not how it works in reality. Often these boundaries are contested, and that leads to four kinds of boundary disputes. First is a definitional boundary dispute, which is when two countries disagree over the interpretation of legal documents that establish boundaries. For example, Argentina and Chile agreed by international treaty in the late 19th century that their boundary would run north to south along the Andes Mountains all the way down to the 52nd parallel. But the very southern tip of that boundary has been disputed ever since because there are a few highly strategic islands there that each country lays claim to. That dispute is primarily because each state disagrees on the wording of a particular part of the original treaty. And then second is a locational boundary dispute, which occurs when an established border moves and competing claims to the land arise. For example, the border between Mexico and the United States is in part made up of the Rio Grande. But over the course of time, that river has changed paths, and that has led to some fighting over who gets to claim the territory of the changing boundary. And then third is an operational boundary dispute, which occurs when the borders are clear, but the function of the border causes conflict. Again, back to the U.S.-Mexico border, a big point of contention between these two states is the flow of undocumented immigrants into the U.S. from Mexico. Now, both states agree that they should share responsibility for addressing the problem, but when it comes to who's going to pay for fixing the problem, well, yeah, that can get nasty. And then fourth is an allocational boundary dispute, which occurs when valuable natural resources lie on both sides of a boundary. In this case, the dispute comes down to who has the rights to that resource. For example, Iraq has massive oil fields under its territory, and its diminutive little neighbor Kuwait holds sovereignty over a small part of those fields. And a dispute arose in the 1990s when Iraq accused Kuwait of drilling into their portion of the oil fields, and we got ourselves a war because of that dispute. Okay, now to further explore the nature of boundaries, let's consider two other ways they're created. First, boundaries can be created through the creation of demilitarized zones, otherwise known by its nastier acronym, DMZ. Now, basically, this is an area between two states in which it is agreed by treaty that no military presence can exist. And the best-known DMZ runs along the border between North and South Korea, and it's about two miles wide. Now, within this two-mile stretch, no military personnel or operation can occur, but one step beyond that two-mile marker, and both countries have metric buttloads of guns pointed at each other. Okay, second, at other times, boundaries are decided by policy, and here again we return to the Berlin Conference in the 19th century, which drew colonial borders all across Africa that defined each European power's territorial holdings. And again, this agreement was made without a single ounce of input from any African leader, and many of those boundaries remain today and have caused an awful lot of disputes. And finally, we get to maybe the juiciest of boundary explorations, namely sea boundaries. And for this, I need to introduce you to UNCLOS, which is a tidy little acronym for the United Nations Conference on the Law of the Sea. So this is an international treaty that decided for all states that border the sea, their political boundaries would extend 12 nautical miles into what's known as their territorial sea. And that's important because states aren't merely interested in exerting sovereignty over the use of resources buried under their dirt, they also want to control what goes on in the water. So for example, China's political boundaries don't stop here. They go all the way out here, and all the laws that govern this place also govern this place. Now that treaty divided the seas into four zones, but the most important zone for our purposes is the Exclusive Economic Zone, or the EEZ. Now, this zone extends 200 nautical miles from the coast, and within that zone, each country has exclusive rights to natural resource extraction. And the reason you need to know this 
this is because EEZs can sometimes be the cause of real nasty disputes between states. Case in point, the Spratly Islands in the South China Sea. Now, this group of hundreds of uninhabited islands is strategic not only because it is believed that they hold many valuable natural resources, but also because they sit right in the middle of a high-traffic sea-based trade lane. And even though the 200 nautical mile rule says that China has no claim on these islands, China has claimed them nonetheless. And to support that claim, they've been building human-made islands in the area to justify their claim that these islands fall within their territorial EEZ. However, Vietnam, Indonesia, Malaysia, and Brunei also argue that these islands fall under their respective territorial holdings. So that's causing a real big fight. And if these countries can't reach an agreement with China through UN arbitration, it's likely that they're gonna go ahead and fight it out. Okay, click here to keep reviewing for Unit 4, and click here to grab my AP Human Geography Heimler Review Guide, which has everything you need to get an A in your class and a 5 on your exam in May. I appreciate you coming around, and I'll catch you on the flip-flop. Heimler out.